right off the bat, um, I want to uh, I want to acknowledge that forests, and this is true of pretty pretty much most or maybe all plant communities, they're limited by three things: uh, water, light, and nutrients. What's going to happen in the course of looking at different forest types across the world and across California, we're going to find that these three factors come up again and again uh, in virtually every context that we, uh, in which we discuss forests. Um, from their, uh, the adaptations of tree, individual, uh, the adaptations of individual tree species to water limitation, uh, which is front and center in an arid environment like California, um, to how forests deal with limitation of light, both in how they develop and how they respond to changes in light, whether that's more light, which happens when there's some sort of disturbance, or less light, which happens as forests become more dense. Um, Forests also respond to soil nutrients, or I should say they can be limited by soil nutrients. Um, and uh, one of the best examples of that are the tropics, which oftentimes are phosphorus limited. Uh, forests are also limited by biological agents, um, such as you know, insects and diseases, and that's my specialty. That's actually why I'm at Cal Poly. That's, um, I teach a forest health class. And it's all about those biological agents. Um, and they certainly shape and limit forests, but um, definitely our emphasis here is on, on these first three factors. Uh, management also shapes forests, influences how they develop, the way they look, why they look the way they do. Um, and those are, um, we, we dabble in that in this class, um, although if you, if you really want to know techniques about how to manage forests and, and why uh, you do certain things at certain times, the silviculture class, which is taught here in some other forest management classes, go more into that. Um, what we're trying to do here is understand the basics of what drives forests, structures them, and, and it sets us up for everything else that we, that we might want to know about them, like how they respond to insect outbreak or how we manage them. Cool. Uh, and that photograph is, is from California. That's from the Mojave Desert. That's the Providence Range. It's uh, kind of way out there, not far from needles. Um, there's a forest on top of that mountain range. Um, here's an example of light limitation. This is from Northern California. It's a uh, a wet area, wet part of the state. This is Humboldt County. Um, very uh, relatively productive forests up here. Uh, what you've got is uh, mostly Douglas fir, some redwood in this photograph, and then a lot of tan oak. That's the broadleaf species. These forests are wet. They're generally not limited by moisture. At least they're not as limited by moisture as they are by light. This is a dense forest. It's got continuous canopy cover that is restricting light reaching the forest floor or any of the trees that are growing under the, dog, the, the canopy here. Um, it's hard to grow, it's hard for trees to grow under other trees and uh, light limitation is, is a very, um, it's, it's a big problem for, for trees and uh, they have to overcome it if they're gonna um, live for a long period of time. And, and, and reproduce a lot or even become very large trees. Constant problem for trees. And then nutrients, like I say, uh, many forests are limited by critical soil nutrients. Um, this is a photograph from the South Island of New Zealand. Um, it's kind of a, a, a kind of a little bit circular way of talking about soil nutrients. These soils are volcanic in origin. They're actually uh, quite uh, productive. But in the upper right hand corner of the photograph is a stand of uh, Monterey pine, Pinus radiata, which might not seem like that interesting of a thing for you if you're accustomed to Monterey pine around San Luis Obispo. Uh, but this is, um, it's an exotic species here and it's only able to grow in this environment because it has a mycorrhizae 
that allows it to um, to acquire critical soil nutrients. So that's kind of an ecological way that soil nutrients are limiting these forests. But there are other examples as well, and we'll talk about them. Um, it would be, I would be remiss if I didn't emphasize kind of, you know, so those are the three factors that are gonna come up a lot. They're gonna come up repeatedly throughout the class as we talk about what, how forests work. But let's talk about the gorilla in the room, the, the 500 pound gorilla, 1,000 pound elephant, whatever that saying is. Uh, in the Western US, um, where most of our exam, where we're mostly think, what we're mostly thinking about, given your experience here at Cal Poly, you know, moisture is the thing that structures uh, forests really east of Arkansas. Arkansas, excuse me, Arkansas. Arkansas, Arkansas, <laughs> um, east of Arkansas and south of Wisconsin, it, moisture limitation is the is is the dominant factor influencing forests. So this is, this photograph is taken high up on the slopes of Mount Tom. That's um, in the eastern Sierra. Uh, this is a high elevation forest. You can see that things are pretty sparse here. Um, even though it's high elevation and it gets more precipitation than San Luis Obispo, it's still moisture limited and everything about this ecosystem reflects that from how the trees conserve, individual tree species conserve moisture, uh, water, to um, the density of the forests. It's going to come up a lot. <clears throat> forests, uh, change in time and these limitations of moisture and light and even to some degree nutrients vary within years as well as um, among forests. Uh, this is an example of a senescent forest. This is uh, also from the Eastern Sierra. This is near North Lake, near Lake Sabrina. Um, this is an Aspen stand, you know, it's just was I was glad to be up there at the right time to get this like brilliant orange and red. I've never been up there. Uh, I've been up there a bunch of times and I've never quite seen it like this. Um, what's happening here is that these, these plants are senescing in order to avoid frosts. Uh, and what's, what's happened, which is um, in, in this case, they're, they're senescing to avoid frost and that means that they're, they're avoiding low temperatures. Senescence is also an adaptation to avoiding periods of drought. And, um, you know, forests, forests and trees have to deal with the resource limitations that they face, and there are a number of ways that they do that. Um, here's an example of uh, two, two different strategies for dealing with moisture limitation. And one is senescence. So there's some more, this is on uh, White Mountain in, um, uh, in California, uh, this is just to the east of uh, the mountain range to the east of um, of the one that I just showed. And um, what you've got here is uh, aspen down here. You can see it's senescing. And then you've got evergreen species here. It's just a different strategy for dealing with the same problem, moisture and temperature variation. And uh, these are these are bristlecone pine. This is in the area that's got the oldest living known living trees, um, those, are, those are in the White Mountains. <clears throat> and uh, here's a photograph of Carrizo Plain. If you've been out there, um, it's a popular time to go. Of course, we're all um, sheltering in place now. Um, and uh, we're, um, you know, it's, uh, Carrizo Plain is not a, ecosystem that's dominated by forest trees, but it is, um, but it is a good example of how uh, con climate conditions, when they vary um, uh, between years, changes how ecosystems look. Um, what you're seeing here, it happens in Carrizo Plain, is that when you have a lot of moisture in one particular year, you, uh, you get different plants dominating, um, you get different uh, allocations to flowering and so forth. Um, and uh, the point here is that interannual variation in climate and temperature precipitation creates, uh, creates dynamic communities and shapes plant distribution. Um, 
And it's obvious here in this photograph of Parizzo Plain, but it happens in forests also. And, that'll, and we'll see examples of that from time to time. I haven't gotten to get out to Carrizo. I wanted to this year, but of course, um, you know, I'm trying to trying to do what the what the state is asking me to do, uh, as we all are. And um, I'm a little little bum not to get out there. I'd like to know what it looks like this year. Okay. Um, I guess I clicked on. It. Okay, here we go. Um, another thing, and. Uh, that is going to come up a lot in our class and it's very important for uh, this, how forests become structured and that's history. Um, people have a, the greatest probably impact on the structure of natural ecosystems on earth. Um, we've seen uh, the human development has, a, has accompanied rapid and extensive loss of species um, and this is a, a consequence of the manipulation of eco ecosystems for different reasons, oftentimes for um, some sort of economic um, uh, purpose. Uh, these are some photographs of some etchings from the British Museum. I took these um, about eight years ago and they surprised me, you know, it's like, I guess back in the day, you used to use lions when you're, you know, in warfare or something. Um, and then there are other ones, you know, like there's this lion with the, the arrows in it. It's just, you know, it's sort of like uh, wild, the wild being dominated by mankind or, you know, um, I guess, I guess that's the idea there. Um, I kind of always, I always like to show this uh, pretty early on in ecology class, just to point out that uh, many species have been lost, particularly large predators, and that's, uh, a consequence, I guess, of some human and wildlife, uh, consequence of human wildlife conflict. Um, but history, history matters in all kinds of respects. It matters in forests. Um, this is a photograph of Lime Kiln State Park. This is in Big Sur. It's not far away from my office here. And these are old lime kilns. Uh, these were built around turn of the century. Um, they are, uh, kilns for producing lime, which is a critical component of cement. Um, these things saw their heyday after San Francisco burned. So um, there was a lot of lime that was produced in order to uh, fuel, um, fuel reconstruction of the city. And the uh, kilns were run on redwood. So all the, uh, much of the old growth redwood forest in Big Sur was cut down for the dual purpose of rebuilding San Francisco and producing lime. Um, that has had a very measurable effect on species composition and structure in this area. And it, um, anytime that you have a lot of clearance or clearance of, of you know, specific individual trees, like the largest trees, um, or, or trees of a certain species, it's gonna have a long lasting effect on forests. And you can, met, you can see that in Big Sur as well. And then there's some other, uh, you know, examples. And, you know, um, normally when I teach this class, I try to emphasize the places that we'll go together. But since we're not really going anywhere together, we may as well talk about, you know, these, these, uh, these far flung places. Um, this is Palenque, it was a major city in the Yucatan, uh, lowland tropical forests. Uh, this is in Chiapas, Mexico. Um, it's a really cool uh, ruins. It's, it's extensive, it's well excavated. Um, uh, many of the Mayan mega cities, and these cities of, of um, you know, sometimes 100,000 people, uh, they required extensive land clearance and oftentimes collapsed after their soils were depleted. Um, those past management actions shape the current forests around these things. So you can go into the tropics, even these places that are really wild and really dynamic um, and changing a lot, lots of product, you know, high productivity. There, uh, the distribution, the species composition, the biomass of the forests that surround it for miles and miles around these, are influenced by this uh, past era of, um, of management by these civilizations. And I should also emphasize that a lot of these cities, like, like I say, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, um, 
when uh, the Spanish uh, ma friars were marching through these areas, they sometimes, they had no idea that these ruins were present. There are accounts of people walking through old ruins and not even realizing what it was that they were walking through. Um, it's only really been in the last few decades that we realize just how, uh, well, we knew about the, these ruins were, were, have been excavated over the course of the last century, but over the last few decades, we realized just how um, impactful these civilizations were on, on the surrounding forests. Um, and then uh, occasionally, I try to um, show examples of this uh, when it's appropriate, and we don't go too much into it, but um, pollution and contamination are another impact of of people on forests. We can see it in a lot of different places. Um, this is a, the drainage that goes, the main drainage through the city of Oaxaca. All of the riparian, most of the riparian trees have been cleared and then there's, there's a lot of contamination, um, garbage and stuff, which has an impact on the forests. Um, and you, you don't actually have to go to the developing world to see that kind of thing. You can see it much closer to home um, this is on the American River in Sacramento and um, that boat that you see there, which is just like a little hot spot of, of hazardous waste has been dumped on the side of the river. Um, and those kinds of things impact, for, impact forests, um, can degrade forests as well. 